We're going to begin today with 2 Kings uh, chapter 5. We're in our series as we're looking at the life of Elijah and Elisha. And we've just been going through 1 and 2 Kings, taking a look at the circumstances and events in their lives. And we've made it all the way to chapter 5 in 2 Kings. So I'm going to read the first few verses here down through around verse uh, 8. And uh, then we'll go back and take a look at what uh, God's Word says. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. You know, this reminds me of the two Texas ranchers who were bragging about the, the size of their ranches. And one rancher asked the other, he said, well, what's the name of your ranch? And he said, well, the name of my ranch is the Rocking R, ABC, Flying W, Circle C, Bar U, Stable 4, Box 4, Rolling M, Rainbows Inn, Silver Spur Ranch. The questioner was much impressed and exclaimed, "Woo, man, that is some kind of name. How many head of cattle do you run? He answered, not many. Very few can survive the branding. Think about that for a moment. You know, pride can cause us to do some, some foolish things. And we're going to see in this, this lesson this morning that this man named Naaman was a man full of pride. And his pride almost cost him his life. Now, you'll notice right off the bat that he is someone of, of, of stature. I mean, you, you can't help but notice right here in the, in, the, in the very first verse, it says he, he was a commander. It says he, he was a great man. Uh, it says he was highly regarded. Uh, he was victorious. And he was a valiant soldier. So this guy named Naaman had a lot of things going for him. Military leader, well-connected politically. He was in tight with the commander-in-chief. He, he was uh, victorious on the battlefield. I mean, he, he was somebody to aspire to. He was great in the sight of others. And this seems to have led him to a place of pride in his life. You know, a while back I was watching a, uh, some sports commentators, and they were talking about something Joe Paterno once said uh, to one of his quarterbacks. And this quarterback was uh, someone who was really good, and they, they were really bragging on him. And Paterno told the young quarterback that all the accolades he was receiving, they were like poison. They were all right as long as they were not swallowed. When we look at General Naaman, we see a man who seems to have swallowed the accolades. He enjoyed a high status, and it kind of went to his head. Now, if we're not careful, all of us in here, our, our accomplishments our talents, our, our abilities, really any advantage we seem to have in life, if we're not careful, that can go to our heads. I want you to pause for just a moment and think about some advantages that you have in life. Notice I said advantages in the plural because I believe most of us have more than one advantage. And by that I mean maybe, maybe you happen to be particularly nice looking. That's an advantage. Or maybe you enjoy a nice income. Or maybe you have a, a, a nice bank account. Or maybe you're very, very talented and, and you're very skilled. Maybe you own a lot of jewelry. I don't know. What, 
What advantages do you have in life? Maybe you have a nice home. Maybe you have a very nice car. Whatever advantages you happen to have, or even perceived advantages, if you're not careful, that can lead you to think more of yourself than you should. If you're not careful, those very advantages can lead you to feel superior to others, and that's where pride crops up in our lives. And we kind of, kind of see that with this, this fellow named Naaman. He's very powerful. He's, he's popular. Uh, the texture, he seems to be relatively wealthy. He's got thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars he's taken along with him to get this, this cure. And he's, uh, he's, he's got a lot of good things going for him. But he does have one problem. He has a big problem. He has this, this dreaded disease called leprosy. And leprosy would usually come about in someone's, uh, on someone's body by a white spot. You know, they might see a white spot come up on their skin and kind of a dull white spot. And, and before long, that white spot would turn into a, a sore, uh, an oozing sore. And that particular part of the body would become numb and it would literally start to rot away. So it wasn't unusual in biblical times to see lepers without eyes, uh, maybe an ear missing, a part of the nose missing, hands, toes, feet. It, it was a terrible, dreaded disease. And Naaman appears to be in the early stages of this disease. So he's probably got his bronze skin out there. You know, he's Middle Eastern. He's, he's a area of Syria there. And uh, he's probably noticing he's got this white spot on his skin. I don't know where it was. Maybe it was on his arm. Maybe it was on his hand. Could have been on his face. Could have been on his neck. Could have been on his nose. I don't know, know where it is. But, but, but he is in the early stages of leprosy. Uh, and I like what the commentator Matthew Henry says. He says, uh, even with all of Naaman's glory, not even the basest slave in all of Syria would trade skins with him. So he was in trouble. Even though he had all these wonderful blessings at his disposal, he had this dreaded disease. Notice what it says in, in verse 2. There's an Israelite slave girl in his, in his household. And she's a believer in God. She'd been taken in battle. and She was a captive. Sometimes that's how people would become slaves. Back then one army would go in and conquer the people. And they would take some of them away as slaves. And that appears to be what's happening here. And this Israelite slave girl is in his home. And she's a believer in the one true God. It's always, it's always good to have a believer in the one true God in your household. And he has one there. She may be there against her will, but she's there nonetheless. And she can't help but notice uh, Naaman's white spots. She notices that he has this dreaded disease called leprosy, and she, she wants to tell him how to be cured. So she gets word to him that there is a prophet in Samaria, which is also called Israel at the time, and this prophet, and we know him to be Elisha, can heal him of this dreaded disease. And we've seen in this study that Elisha was capable of doing some some. Some fantastic miracles. I mean, he parted the Jordan River. You know, he, he uh, multiplied the loaves of bread. He even raised someone from the dead. So he's fully capable of, of raising uh, uh, or getting rid of these, these spots on Naaman's skin. If he can raise somebody from the dead, he won't have any problem curing this man of his leprosy. And I think, too, we, we get a glimpse into this unnamed slave girl's character. You know, she could have kept her mouth shut. She could have thought to herself, I hope he dies. I hope he dies a cruel, slow death. I hope that leprosy claims his body little by little by little until there's nothing left of him. Keep in mind, she's been kidnapped and she's a slave girl being held against her will. And yet, that doesn't seem to be her attitude at all. She's concerned with her captor's health. Could there be a lesson here? On loving our enemies. Could there be a lesson here on overcoming evil with good? Probably so. Shouldn't go without notice that this lowly slave girl is giving life, giving instruction to the proud general. Here we have someone in the most humble of circumstances giving direction to someone who is in the highest of circumstances. And to his credit, he listens to what she says. He, he's desperate. He's willing to do whatever it takes to get cured. Sometimes today when people have uh, diseases, think of cancer, for example, uh, 
people will get desperate. They'll reach out for all kinds of treatments. They'll hear about things in Mexico that the FDA hadn't approved, and they'll, they'll go across the border and get special treatment. Or maybe they'll go to some foreign country to get the treatment. That's kind of what's going on here. This guy's desperate. There is no cure. He hears that there is a cure across the border, so he's willing to go to Israel to find his cure. So he asks his king for permission. Can I get off work and go over here and get this cure? There's supposedly a prophet over there that can cure me. And the king said, no problem, man. I'll even write you a letter of recommendation. By all means, go get cured. The king liked Naaman. He was a victorious general. He was bringing him victories on the battlefield. For those of you who like to watch football, I don't know if we have many here that like to watch football, but yeah, the preseason just got underway. And it's pretty hard to watch preseason football games. And one of the main reasons it's hard to watch them is because they, they don't let the starters play very much. And it's really rare to see the starting quarterback get to play very much. And the reason they don't let the starters play, and especially the starting quarterback, they might let him come in for a series or two, or not at all. My favorite team, the Cowboys, I watched them. The first string guy never came in. It was torturous to watch. But the reason they hold them back is because they, they don't want them to get hurt. They want to preserve their health. They know that if they're going to have a chance at victory, they got, they got, they got to protect them during the preseason. Those games don't count. Well, it was kind of like that with Naaman here. He, he wanted, they wanted to protect him. They, they didn't want him to die. They didn't want this terrible disease to claim his body. So he says, by all means, go, man. Go try to find that cure. Go over there across the border and find the prophet of God. So that, that's what he does. And he goes over there. And when he gets there, he, he arrives uh, with the letter. And uh, the letter said, with this letter, I'm sending my servant Naaman to you so that you can cure him of his leprosy. And as soon as the king of, of Israel read that, what did he do? He grabbed his, his royal robe, which I'm sure was very expensive, and ripped it. And that was a way of showing distress in that culture in that time. Even today, some Jews will rip a garment when they're really stressed out, they're really really worried about something when they think they're about to come to their end or undoing so this guy rips the king rips it because he thinks that this king next door who has a more powerful army by the way he thinks he's trying to pick a fight with me he's asking me to do something impossible that he knows i can't deliver on and when i do not deliver on it then he's going to attack me so that's what he thinks is going on so he's all he's all stressed out about it and i couldn't help but think to myself as i read that how, how often are we like that king some, some problem crops into our life, something that we don't think we can get out of. Our imagination goes crazy with us. We start thinking of all kind of terrible scenarios. And rather than reach out to God like this king should have done, we choose to stew in our own anxiety. We worry about it. We don't know how it's going to get fixed. We don't know what's going to happen. We imagine the worst. And that's what's going on here with this king. When all he needed to do was turn the problem over to God. And in his case, he had Elisha running around in his country who was a prophet of prophets. Remember, he asked for a, a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And when we see in the text, he's doing all kinds of miracles and working all kinds of things. I mean, he's got him there in the country. All he had to do is turn the problem over to him, but, but, but he doesn't do it. He, he chooses to remain stressed out about it. And so often we do the very... Very same thing, rather than turn the problem over to God. Well, somehow or another, Elisha, he, he gets wind of what's going on, and he sends word to the king. He says, you know, why have you torn your robes? Have the man of God come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Let's look at verses 9 and 10 and take note of how all this unfolds. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and wash, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. So he's, he's, he's telling him here, he's supposed to go, Elisha sent a word to him, he's supposed to go to, to Elisha's house, and he, he does go, but notice what it, what it says there. It says uh, he stops at the door. That, that is significant. Verse 9, so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. You say, well, what's so significant about that? Well, in, in the, the Hebrew language, the, the, way, the way it's written, and we can't really, we don't pick up on it too much, but the idea is that, is that uh, he stops at the door because he, he, 
he feels maybe uh, too good to go into Elisha's home. In other words, he's only going to go so far, and he stops there at the door. And when you consider the context, it, it does kind of fit what's going on here. He, he's wanting um, Elisha to come out to him. So he's only going to go so far, and he stops. That, that seems to be the idea of what's going on. So he's, he's taking all his, his servants and, and all his, his gifts and his entire retinue, and they go to Elisha's house for the cure and, and stop right there at the door. And then he's given instruction on how to be cured. He's told that he needs to go dip in the Jordan River, and he will be cured. He has, he's told that he should go and dip seven times, and that uh, he, he would receive his cure. So let's just continue reading. Verse 11. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Arbana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in one of them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. So here this guy is. He is on the cusp of getting healed. He's given instruction on how to receive his healing. And he does not like the prescription. He doesn't like what he's being told. He wants Elisha to come out with a lot of pomp and a lot of ceremony and do some kind of hand waving over his spots and he wants them all to magically go away. So he's, he's looking for something uh, sensational, something uh, fantastic, something that goes along with who he thinks he is. He does not like this idea of going and dipping seven times in the Jordan. You may be thinking, well, why not? What's wrong? Well, the Jordan was a, a relatively muddy river. And, he, and, 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 and Naaman's saying here, well, why, why, well, I've got rivers in my home country, where I'm from, clear mountain streams. Why can't I go back to one of them? Why do I have to go to this Jordan River and, and dip in that river seven times? He does not at all like the prescription for his disease. He's not at all thrilled about it. And ironically, he, he's taking his entire retinue and all this money he's brought for gifts and everything that he's come to do, and he's turning around and he is going in the other direction. At this particular point in the story, he is walking away from his potential healing. So here he is. He can be healed, but he's not doing what he needs to do. I think of that verse in Scripture, Pride goeth before destruction. And that's what we see. His pride is blocking him. And again, but notice, notice what, what's going on here in verse, verse 13. It says, verse 13 says, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he calls you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. So finally, he gives in. Finally, he does what he's supposed to do, and his skin becomes like that of a young boy. Don't you know he felt good when he got up out of that water? Dipped in it seven times. One, two, three, four, five. Ain't nothing happening. Six, nothing six. Finally, finally, he, after the seventh time, he comes up, and his skin is like, like new, man. I mean, he's looking, looking good, cleansed, probably not a blemish on him. God had completely healed this man of his leprosy. A wonderful miracle had taken place. And then notice what else takes place. Verse 15 says, Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Nathan urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Nathan, uh, Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of two mules can carry. For your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. Wow. So this guy is not only healed physically, most importantly, he is healed spiritually. He's saying, I'm no longer going to worship the pagan gods in my country. 
that aren't real gods at all. Now I'm going to worship the one true God and just let me take back two mule loads of dirt back to my country so I can have some of this, this holy land with me when I go back. So he's, he's completely, he's, he's not only changed physically, we see a guy here who has changed spiritually as well. And I think when we, what we see here is a guy going through a, a spiritual transformation. We see a guy who starts out proud and a guy through his humility finds healing. So let's, let's take a closer look at what's going on here in the text. I, I think we can uh, see ways that we can dismantle pride in our own lives because I'm convinced that all of us deal with pride to some extent. There, there's going to be times in all of our lives where we're tempted to be puffed up with pride. And pride is really, it, it's really lethal spiritually. And if you think about it, pride is at the opposite end of the spectrum from Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is he's, he's extreme humility. And pride takes us far, far away from him. In fact, pride is more associated with the devil than it is with Jesus, for sure. So let's take a look at, at this and see what kind of lessons we can learn. For one, I'm going to say this. If you want to dismantle pride in your life... Be willing to listen to others. A lot of times when a person is full of pride, they will not listen to others. And the reason they will not listen to others is because they think they have all the answers. How could anyone else tell them what to do? And the proud person is very resistant to instruction. And you'll notice in this passage, God's trying to, trying to teach Naaman something. He's trying to teach us something as well. Did you notice over and over again... God was giving this proud man direction through a servant. As great as he was, God kept giving him instruction through somebody of, of a, a lower social status. First, it's the slave girl in his home. You know, she, she tells him what to do. And then, and then a, Elisha's servant comes out to him and tells him what he needs to do. And he gets mad and goes off in a huff. And then his own servants go to him and say, Look, if he'd asked you to do something fantastic, wouldn't you have tried to do it? Just do what he says. And in the end, he ends up listening to the servants, and he receives his healing. So I think there's a major lesson here for us. We should never get to the place where we think we're too high and mighty to be told uh, some instruction from somebody who we perceive maybe being beneath us socially. Maybe they make less money. Uh, maybe they don't dress as nice as you. Maybe they don't drive as nice a car as you drive. Maybe, maybe they're not seen as very high in the, in the eyes of the world. But keep in mind, God can speak through them. And God can give you instruction through people who the world doesn't view as very high. And that's something I think God was certainly trying to teach this proud military general. Second, we should be willing to back down. Naaman almost blew it because he wouldn't back down from his wrong attitude. Before his servants talked him into it, uh, man, he, he was about to leave and go back to his country and die a slow, cruel death but to his credit he finally did listen to one of his servants and he did turn and go back uh, but common sense dictates that he had he had no right to be angry about the prescription for his cure you know we have an old axiom that says beggars can't be choosers uh, that's really the position he was in and he wouldn't have found his healing at all if he wasn't willing to back down Sometimes you'll hear celebrities and politicians, they'll make some statement or something, and, and you'll hear them on the news media say, oh, he's doubling down, he's doubling down. That means he's refusing, he's refusing to back down. And, and somehow, some people kind of celebrate that. But when someone's wrong, it's really foolish not to back down. It only makes matters worse when we in our pride will not back down. If you seldom ever admit when you're wrong, you likely have a pride problem. If you seldom say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, you likely have a pride problem. If you angrily reject constructive criticism, you most likely have a pride problem. By the way, people who are very proud, the least little bit of constructive criticism can cause them to erupt and explode. You've probably been around people like that. But seriously, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. If you never admit you're wrong, that's a sign that there's a, there's a, there's a root of pride in your life and, and you need to deal with it because it can, it can lead you down the wrong road and, and lead you away from God. I'm reminded here of the, the Native Americans in, 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 in Florida, the way they used to catch alligators. And I've read where they would take these, uh, these stakes 
and they drive stakes in the ground and make a, like a, a long conduit and then close it off at the end. And the, the conduit of stakes would be just wide enough for the alligator to get in there, but it'd be so close that he couldn't turn around. And so an alligator will just go right up into this conduit of stakes and go all the way to the end of the bait. And then when it, it can't get out, rather than uh, just back their way out, they won't. They won't back up. They refuse to back up. And if this is too, too tight, they can't turn around. And although they're struggling and floundering as the spears go into them, uh, they end up being a victim of their own stubbornness. They won't back down. Third, we should be willing to give God credit for our accomplishments. We see right there in verse 1, right off, that it was God who gave Naaman his victories. God is the one, through his sovereignty, who puts us where we are in life. He's the one who gives us the blessings we have in life. Ultimately, without him, we're nothing. And it's very important that you realize that. Uh, I hope nobody here says, I'm where I am because of what I've done. I pull myself up by the bootstraps. You know. No, you're where you are because God has allowed you to be where you are. You have the talents you have because God's given you those talents. You have the money in your bank account because God has provided you with that money. I mean, we're all, we're all just stewards down here managing the stuff that God's given us. And it's important that we realize we're not where we are because of us. It's because of God. John Ortberg tells a story about a CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And this particular CEO uh, pulled into a service station to get gas. Then he went in to pay. And when he came back out, he noticed his wife engaged in a deep discussion with the service station attendant. It turned out that she used to date that man back in high school. And the CEO got in the car and the two drove in silence. And the CEO, he was feeling, feeling pretty good about himself when he finally spoke. He said, I bet I know what you're thinking. I bet you're thinking you're glad you married me, a Fortune 500 CEO, and not him, a service station attendant. And his wife said, no. I was thinking if I had married him, he would be a Fortune 500 CEO and you would be the service station attendant. I'm not sure who had the biggest pride problem in that situation. But really the advantages that we have in life are ultimately from God. And if we'll keep that in the forefront of our minds, it'll go a long way in keeping us humble. And I'll close this in James chapter 4, verse 6. And we see this in various places in the Bible. And I think it's something that God wants us all to realize. Scripture says that God is opposed to the proud. And that word opposed is actually a, a military term. God goes to war with the proud, but it says he gives grace to the humble. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, I pray, Lord, that we would emulate the behavior of your son, Jesus, who, who is really the epitome of humility. I pray, Lord, that we would all be the humble servants that you've, you've called us to be. And I, I pray that we not let our advantages and our blessings uh, uh, cloud our judgment of, 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 of who we are and, and what our attitude should be in life. And I pray, Lord, right now, if there's anyone here who needs to become a Christian this morning, I pray, God, that they would do what Naaman eventually did. Listen to instruction, humbly obey, and receive salvation. For all these things I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, think, think about that for a moment. We're all, before we come to Christ, we're all kind of like Naaman. You know, we're kind of full of ourselves and think more highly of ourselves than we should. And then God, God speaks through his servants, through a lot of people in the world kind of look down on. God speaks and gives us a message, gives us instruction. And then it's up to us what we do with that message. Will we accept the message and get the cure and take the, take the medicine for our ailment? And our ailment is, is sin, really sickness from sin, spiritual sickness. Like it or not, we're spiritually sick until we find Jesus. We, we need him. He's the cure. And, and God's word gives us a pretty, pretty simple prescription to the problem. We have to have faith. Just accept God's gift for you in faith. 
receive his, his grace and faith. And, and, then, and then what does he tell us to do? He tells us to go and be dipped or, uh, what I'm say, plunged in, in the waters of baptism for the forgiveness of our sins. And then we receive our cleansing. Our sins are washed away. And we're clean before God. And, and in a lot of ways, again, it's, we're, we're kind of like, like Naaman. What will we do? We say, no, I don't think I need to get baptized. You'd be surprised how many people tell me that. Like, man, that's what the Bible says. You better get baptized. That's what God says. It, it might sound too simple for some people. Some people might think, I'm not going to let some preacher do that to me. And, you know, and, and it's sad because something that's pretty simple, uh, people walk away and, and, and go away like Naaman almost did. So I want to plead with you this morning. If, you, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come to Him in faith and repentance, agreeing to live for Him and, and, and be immersed for the forgiveness of your sins. If you haven't done that, I want to invite you to come and, and receive your cure this morning. It is the cure for the sin problem. God will take you and cleanse you. And just like Naaman got that new skin, He's going to give, give you a, a new self, a new creation. The Holy Spirit coming inside you to work from the inside out. And help you become the person that God wants you to be. And ultimately you get to spend eternity with God. If you need to, to be cleansed this morning, I want to invite you to come as we sing this song. Let's all stand. see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high. Oh, I want to see Jesus lifted high. I want to see Jesus lifted high.
Got a few announcements for you. Uh, keep in mind, starting next Sunday, we're going to have our recharge services. Uh, this is a time where uh, I'm compelling you to invite your friends and neighbors. Uh, of course, I'd like for you to bring yourself to along with them so that we can have a, a recharge service. It's very important, I think, that, that we show that we're in support of what's going on here by our attendance. And I just hope every one of you will show up and bring somebody with you. So we're going to start that Sunday morning, and that's going to go uh, to Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So it's going, to, it's going to go from the 21st through the 24th, and it's going to start at, at 6.30 at night, uh, Sunday night from, from then on. It's going to be free, so uh, again, plan to be here. And we will have a, a dinner on the Wednesday night, and it will be at 6. Also, we've got a couple of swimming events coming up for the youth. We've got one August 27th, that's a pool party at the, at the Arthur home, and that's for the, for the youth. And then a Sunday, August 28th, at 11 a.m. through 1 p.m., we have a swim party for the fifth grade and under, so we're trying to get all our swim parties in before the fall gets here, and I think it's plenty, plenty warm to have a swim party. Also, the ladies' Bible study is going to start up uh, August 30th, that's Tuesdays, uh, from 6 to 7. So put that on your calendar, ladies. And also there's another, there's a ladies' event August 26th and 27th at uh, Brown Missionary Baptist Church in South Haven. Um, you can see more on that in your bulletin if you're interested in doing that. Can't leave this out. How many of y'all like to stretch? Well, they say stretching's good for you. We're going to have uh, some stretching going on around here starting August 30th for, for the ladies on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, it's co-ed. It's going to start at, at 5.30. Um, so it's, a, it's a free stretch class, okay? It said, uh, and then it says here, enjoy a calming, stress-reducing class that's good for your body and soul. I don't know about you, but I need some, some relaxation. So maybe I need to show up here and stretch We all. All right? Child care will be provided on Wednesdays. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Y'all ready to sing one more song before we dismiss? Let's go. Let's sing now. Unbelievable, I'm blown away, it's true, by the matchless love that I found in you. Undeniable, the change in me, I've never felt so free. It makes me want to dance, oh, you make me want to dance, yeah, when I think about how you love me, you love me. the way, just the way I am, oh, just the way I am, yeah. Ever patiently, 
accepting me Lord you love in spite of everything I do but oh so faithfully you're committed to the process that makes me like you and I feel like I can dance Your grace is more than enough to cover all my sins. Oh, you washed them away, so right here today, you love me just the way I am. I am, yeah. Make me want to dance, yeah, yeah. You love me, you love me. Great week.